Hi everybody, Steve Scott here with another question and answer Q&A video. And this time the question is a rather personal one and I don't mind answering it at all actually. And the question is this, who are the people that most influenced you in your judo career, your sambo career, whatever it may be? So uh, I'd like to acknowledge those people who helped me. We all have people who helped us in our lives. And uh, these are the people who I think were some of the most influential in my life on and off the mat. And first of all, I think all of you that watch my videos know that uh, I'm, I'm a coach. I mean, this is what I do. I'm a grassroots level coach. I'm a club coach. I don't claim to be the best and uh, they're the brightest. But uh, what, with, what, with what I have and, and the positive things I have that I can offer to everyone uh, learning from me, uh, these are the people on this video who helped me get to that point. So uh, with, with, with a great deal of humility, and uh, a great deal of appreciation. I'm just going to highlight the uh, the lives in a very brief way on, on each person, the uh, how they influenced me in my career, both on and off the mat, actually. So uh, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy the video. Jerry Sweat was my first sensei. He was a Nidan, and he got it from the Kodokan. He's classically trained in Judo, and he's also a Sandan in Aikido. So as a result, when I started with Jerry in 1965, uh, I learned both Judo and Aikido right off the bat. And in fact, he required all of us Judo kids to, uh, uh, the older boys anyway, and the girls, to uh, take Aikido from him at least once a week while we were doing Judo the rest of the time. And I was just about on the mat every night of the week starting, I said, like I said, 1965. Jerry was a tremendous influence in my life. He was a, a very, very wonderful human being. God rest his soul, a great man. And he was also a, a very good coach. He, he really uh, had, had a way of teaching and explaining things which, which I learned early on from him. In fact, it was because of Jerry that I, uh, one, I, I developed a keen uh, sense and awareness of using Japanese terminology and how to describe the movements of judo. But also, I think even more important, um, he, he encouraged me to be a teacher. He, when I was 15 and helping him, I'd come in early to help the, the younger, newer students and teaching them their breakfalls. And Jerry would encourage me to, to be a teacher. He said, Steve, you have a, um, a God-given gift to teach people. He said, he said you, you should expand on that. You should develop that and become a, a sensei yourself someday. And just like him, he was a great teacher, and he really would explain things thoroughly. And when he taught you something, you really understood it. And from that basic beginning, that very start, I, I developed a sense of, of learning things and learning to be analytical and then putting them back together. So I owe very much uh, a gr great deal of gratitude. I have a great deal of gratitude for Jerry Sweat, a wonderful man. And he started me out, and I'll never forget him. After training with Jerry Sweat for several years, I then switched clubs to uh, train with Ken Reganator. And uh, the reason I switched clubs was because Jerry was uh, got out of coaching and no longer was teaching judo. He did teach some Aikido, but he was no longer teaching judo. So I made a, a switch to another club and started training with Ken. And Ken Reganator was the one who introduced me to uh, jujitsu. And it was the Kodenkan or Danzanru system of jiu-jitsu he practiced. He was very good at it. In fact, that was his preference was jiu-jitsu, but he was also a very good judo coach. So I continued to train in judo along with learning new skills in jiu-jitsu as well. And it was because of Ken that I developed a keen interest in both cross-training and also in ground fighting. Ken was very good at submission techniques, and he really emphasized uh, arm locks, leg locks, and strangles because we did leg locks in in Danzan Ryu Koden Kan Jiu Jitsu, so I, I, he was the first one introduced to how to do lower body submissions to me, and it was also Ken that really was the guy that impelled me to get into sambo. At one point, sometime in the early to mid 1970s, he said to me, he said you should try this sambo. He'd read an article in Black Belt magazine about sambo, and of course these are the days before social media and the internet, and you couldn't just go online and find stuff on Sambo. So he had to really dig for it. And uh, he, he saw this article in Black Belt Magazine. He said, I think this Sambo might be right up your alley. You might really like this in addition to what we do here. So I thought about it for a while. And, and about a year or so later, I acted upon it. But it was in, in, and found a, a ways to do Sambo. So that'll, that'll come a bit later when I talk about some other people. But Ken was the one who really introduced me to cross training and how, how important that is. And also, the, the importance of doing good newaza, good ground fighting, and submission techniques. And God rest his soul, Ken was a good man, and uh, I will always be grateful for the uh, help he gave me as uh, being the fellow who continued on after Jerry Sweat to make me actually a better, better judo and jiu-jitsu person. 
Two influential people in my life in judo were my wife, Becky, of course. We met in 1973 at a judo tournament in Independence, Missouri, and we got married in 1975, and we've been uh, traveling the world and always coming back to Kansas City ever since. So, uh, uh, But Becky has been a tremendous influence on me in many ways, personally, of course, in our, in our long, long marriage, but also uh, on the, in the judo and sambo. And she, she was a uh, in, in tremendously talented individual and had a very good analytical mind for judo and sambo. And, you know, in, in all the books I've written, she was the, the, the hardest editor I ever had. So she was very, very um, influential in my thinking. And I, I just, it's to this day, I'm, I'm still grateful to, you know, for, for meeting her and marrying her. Now also, uh, another person um, is uh, Bill Clark. Bill Clark is not a judo man. He was actually in powerlifting and Olympic style weightlifting and was very instrumental in the amateur athletic union back in the uh, 1970s and 60s, 70s and 80s. And it was Bill who uh, really gave me the idea to start writing. So uh, he, he, he put out a, a great um, you know, regional, in fact, national newsletter uh, for the strength sports. And he was very well known in this in the strength game and a very well respected man. And but he was very involved in, of course, AAU weightlifting and, and power uh, lifting and back in those days. And uh, I, I met him at a uh, uh, AAU meeting and um, he, he just gave me great influence, gave me a lot of advice on how to start a regional newsletter. And that's what really started me writing. And I would always send him a copy of it and he would critique it. He was just a great guy. So so Bill Clark was a heavy influence on me in terms of making me think about becoming a writer. And then also that writing made me think more critically and analytically so I could become a better coach and a better technician in judo and sambo and jujitsu. So uh, I credit a lot of uh, success, uh, my success to, to Bill Clark, a great man. And uh, he never stepped in a day on his life in, on a judo mat, but he was a, a heavy influence in my, in my career. My friend Harry Parker was a great influence on me, both on and off the mat. He unfortunately died at the early age of 28, but while he was alive, he, he left a lifelong impression upon me. Um, he was a very analytical guy. He was a great training partner of mine, and we were good friends, and he was very analytical. He could take apart a technique, put it back together, and it would always come out even better after Harry had analyzed it and synthesized it. He was just he had that gift, and he taught me to do that. We would, we would have some great discussions on and off the mat about judo. Uh, he was a consummate technician. He was excellent and a, just a tremendous human being. So Harry Parker, uh, even though he wasn't a coach, he was, he was one of those guys, as I often tell my athletes, sometimes the best coach you have on the mat is your training partner. Well, if you had Harry Parker on the mat as your training partner, you had a great coach. And that was what Harry Parker did for me. God rest his soul, a great man. Your friends are always influential, and if they're in judo, even better for you, I, I, I believe. And in this case, Anne Maria DeMars uh, has been a lifelong friend for both Becky and me, and we met her in 1973 in Racine, Wisconsin at the YMCA Judo Nationals, and we've been friends with her ever since. Uh, we, uh, Anne Maria is the first U.S. judo athlete to win a world judo championship, and she would often come and train. Of course, she trained with a lot of different dojos, but she uh, was, was living in St. Louis and then later Minneapolis and in different places in the United States. And she always would make sure she'd come in and train with us and stay the weekend. We have a spare bedroom and she'd stay for a while. She was always a welcome house guest and a tremendous training partner. Both she and Becky had some great workouts and, and both learned from each other. And, and Anne Maria went on to be a, um, uh, got a bachelor's degree, then master's degree and her doctorate. She's a brilliant person and a very smart businesswoman now living in California. So Anne Marie has always been there as a great friend and certainly an influence in my life and my wife's life and uh, certainly a great influence on me in judo as well. So I credit Anne Marie as being one of the influential people in my lives. So I took Ken Regenator's advice eventually and followed up on Sambo. Find out more about the Russian sport of Sambo. And I, I ended up meeting the National AAU Sambo Wrestling Chairman, Ivan Olson, Dr. Ivan Olson of uh, Bonita, California, near, near San Diego. And Ivan was a great and beneficial and positive influence in my life. Uh, he was the one that um, 
long distance telephone calls. We talked for quite a bit. He was the one that really got me involved in getting into Sambo and giving it a try. And I remember when I, after I put on my, before I put on my first Sambo tournament here in Kansas City in 1977, uh, I called Ivan and I said, I really don't know how to referee this sport. I, I, you know, don't know the rules that well. He said, well, just do like I did. He said, you got the rule book, which was, by the way, was a very, very small rule book. Didn't have much in the way of rules in it. But he said, you got the rule book. He said, just wing it. And he said, have fun. And that was that was his advice. And we did. And it was because of Ivan Olson that he, he influenced me greatly. And he was my mentor in, in getting me involved in Sambo more heavily. And, and um, at one point, I, I traveled out to California. Uh, Becky and I did to compete in some tournaments. And um, before one of the nationals I competed in there, I, we, we stayed with, with, with Ivan and his lovely wife, Myrna. God rest their souls. They're wonderful people. And they, um, they, 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 they treated us like their own children. They, they, they were just wonderful people. And he introduced me to a lot of people. He, he introduced me to Mel Bruno and different people that I'd, I'd heard about all my life in judo. And he knew all these people. And he was the one who told me about a fellow named Morris Allen, who was a Scotsman living in Arkansas of all places. And Ivan told me, Ivan called me up one day and said, there's a Scottish guy. He's living near you. And he said, he said, you should contact this guy because he can teach you more about Sambo. And so based on Ivan Olson's recommendation, um, I ended up contacting Morris Allen and more about Morris in a bit later here. But um, it was Ivan who was my, my mentor in Sambo, and I consider him to be the father of American Sambo, and many other people do too. He, he wasn't just my mentor. He was a mentor to many, many other people. So uh, wonderful man, Dr. Ivan Olson. Morris Allen of Scotland was my first Sambo coach. He was a world Sambo champion, and he was an Olympic wrestler in the 1976 Olympic Games, and he was a world-class judo player as well, representing Great Britain. Uh, and he was in, in the mid seventies, I think 1975, 76, sometime around then is when I first met him. Uh, he was living in Northwest Arkansas in Rogers, Arkansas. And he was working for an old millionaire who had a dojo called Ichiban Dojo. And it was a world-class training facility. And this old millionaire would uh, hire different world-class athletes and coaches and come in from time to time, stay a year or two or whatever it may be. And they would uh, train athletes at, at that dojo. And uh, so Morris was there for about a year or so. And I, I was very fortunate to have him as my first Sambo coach. And it was at the recommendation of Dr. Ivan Olson, then the National AAU Sambo Wrestling Chairman, that I seek out Morris and find him. And I'm so glad that I did because Morris was really a major influence in my, in my career in, in Judo and Sambo. And he's, he's the guy who really started making me thinking about making a technique work for you. In fact, he said to me, make the technique work for you, whether it's judo, samba, whatever it may be, you know, mold it so it fits you like a glove and you can use it when you need to use it. And he said he wasn't so concerned about how pretty it was or the aesthetics of it. It's the function of it. And from that solid base, basic background there, I, he, he, you know, he lit me up. It was just, it was great. To me, it was a revelation because up to that time, I was trying to make, make everything look pretty. And uh, Morris said, don't do that. Make it work. That's what you should do. So was, I credit Morris Allen a great deal with putting me on the right track in a functional, very pragmatic approach to doing judo, sambo, and of course, jujitsu as well. So Morris Allen was a very, very influential person in my life on the mat. I remember meeting Jim Schneeweiss in February 1977 at our very first Missouri Valley Sambo Championships. And he was a about 140 pounder, actually wrestled at 136 and a half, I think, in, in Sambo. But he, he um, was a, a tough guy. And he, he, with a number of other people, showed up at that very first Sambo tournament. And he got to, you know, he was, he loved Sambo. He, it, you know, like a duck to water, he took to it. And right that day, we became very good friends. He and I have maintained a very close personal friendship all these years, since uh, 1977. And, uh, you know, I would often train at his, uh, he, he was a high school wrestling coach, and I would often train with his wrestling team at his high school. And then he would often, he would always come over and very, very frequently come over to welcome Matt and train with us and doing judo and, and sambo as well. Uh, he coached many national level um, sambo champions, and he was uh, very instrumental in, in, in helping develop Becky, 
my wife Becky become a world and Pan American Games Sambo champion. He was very instrumental in her training, and I credit with, with him with that a lot. Um, and he, he, like I said, he developed so many champions. He he was a great teacher. I, I think I sincerely believe Jim Schneeweiss is probably the best teacher I've ever met of any subject. Uh, he can he can explain anything to you, and in very short order you understand what it is. He's just that good of a teacher. And he taught wrestling, and he coached wrestling, and he would take kids from the inner city in Kansas City, Kansas, and develop in, develop these young people into uh, world-class human beings, and certainly very, very top-notch wrestlers. So Jim Schneeweiss was a great influence on me because he would teach me a lot of, of aspects of what he, how he did his wrestling, which was, he was very good at wrestling, and then, of course, I'd help him with the judo, and we had a wonderful combination where we'd help each other out and kind of coach each other along the way. So uh, uh, Jim Schneeweiss is a great influence on me. Rene Pomerel of Luxembourg was a tremendous influence in my career in judo and in sambo and jiu-jitsu as well. Uh, he took me under his wing sometime in the um, oh, late 1970s, mid to late 1970s, up through the 1980s, and I would train with him and uh, wherever he was uh, living at the time. If He was in the U.S. military for a while, then he retired. He was the Olympic Training Center coach in Colorado Springs for a short period of time, but, but I would also have Rene come into Kansas City and train with us at Welcome Mat. So he was the, uh, very influential in me, in my, my thinking in judo. He taught me a lot of concepts about movement and controlling opponents' movements, and he was, he was brilliant. He was the 1980 Olympic, uh, uh, coach for, uh, Olympic team coach for Mexico, and it was because of Rene I was able to go down to Mexico City and train at their Olympic Training Center with some very good athletes and to get that altitude training. And, of course, when you train with Rene Pomerel, you expected a hard workout and you got one. But he was a consummate technician. And many of the things I still teach today, many of the things, uh, I credit to Rene Pomerel for for planting that seed in my mind. And he encouraged me to think and to progress and and you know, get better at what I what I did and, and keep improving always. He was a, a very, very uh, analytical guy, but he was also the kind of guy that make you enthusiastic about getting on the mat and training. So I owe much to Rene Pomerel. God rest his soul, a great man. Bruce Toops is the man who gave me my first break at the national level in coaching. Uh, he was the director of development for U.S. Judo Incorporated, USJI, which is now USA Judo. And as a result, he was in charge of all the development programs uh, in, the, uh, in the entire United States. And he developed a, a system of, of uh, training camps, team selection, par none. He, was the, he is the unsung hero of judo in the United States. I, I credit a lot of wonderful things that have happened in judo to Bruce Toops. Um, he was the one who actually started the, the camp system where we had many training camps for both juniors and seniors at our U.S. Olympic training centers in Colorado Springs, Lake Placid, New York, and in Marquette, Michigan. Um, he was also the one who developed a fair and systematic way of, of, of uh, recognizing and selecting athletes to go on international teams. It was all Bruce. He was a, a brilliant man in that sense. And like I said, he gave me my first chance at, at, at the national level. And um, he, he brought me on board to coach at the, uh, on, on the junior under 21 developmental program and then the coach development program. And eventually I wanted to be the, I went on to become the uh, head of the junior program. And uh, with Bruce's guidance and, and um, certainly sponsorship, and, and encouragement, we developed a wonderful junior development program. And uh, under Bruce, under Bruce, we developed the first uh, coach education program ever. And I was the guy that kind of wrote it, but he was the one that did all the editing, and he he really supervised it and did a good job at that. Uh, but anyway, so I said, like I said, Bruce is a instrumental man in the history of, of U.S. judo. Um, he also is, I, I think, primarily responsible for our. our great development program we had in the 19 late late early well all through the 1980s into the early 90s and people like Anne Maria DeMars who was the first American or US athlete to be a world judo champion Mike Swain Jimmy Pedro all these athletes came up under the tutelage under the program guidance of Bruce Toops so I owe a lot to him and a lot of other people owe a lot to Bruce Toops and he was a uh, a great influence on US judo and certainly a great influence on me Another person who really wasn't necessarily a coach of mine, but a, a colleague and friend of mine is Bob Corwin. Bob Corwin of Yorkville, Illinois, 
uh, it would develop small town kids in, in northern Illinois into world class human beings and world class judo players. And he was a, and is a tremendous coach, tremendous asset. I, I think, in my personal opinion, he is probably the best judo coach to ever come from the United States. He is that good. He is a consummate teacher. He could, he could teach anybody anything. And I think that's one of the, the foremost important things that uh, every coach should have is to be able to teach. And Bob can do that. Bob could also, um, um, you know, inspire people to be better human beings, and he did. He was... He would take those kids from Yorkville all over the world. I mean, all over the United States, certainly all over the world. And I always had a saying that I would tell my kids at Welcome Mat when we compete against the Yorkville team, if you can beat those guys from Yorkville, if you can beat Bob Corwin's guys, or at least compete with them, you can compete with anybody. And, and that's true. Bob Corwin in that small town of Yorkville, Illinois, developed world-class people. So Bob Corwin was a great influence on me. Uh, and I, I, we have a, had a lifelong friendship. We, Becky and I first met him in early 1981, and we've been colleagues and certainly great friends. He's one of my dearest friends on this earth, and uh, I, I, I just can't th say enough good things about it. So Bob Corwin was certainly a heavy influence in my career. John Saylor certainly has been an influence on me on and off the mat. Uh, we're lifelong friends. We've been friends for many, many years, and uh, he is to me, one of the most innovative, progressive, intelligent, and actually brilliant guys when it comes to understanding the movement of judo or anything, whether it's jiu-jitsu, sambo, whatever it may be, and also in, in, in the area of strength training and, and, and you know physical development for athletes. Uh, he's, he's one of the best in the country, in my opinion, if, if not the best. So John has been a tremendous influence on me. Uh, when he started the Shingitai Jiu-Jitsu organization back in 1984, 1985, I was probably one of the very first people to jump on board and totally support him. There's concepts of training in the Shingitai concept of training. Uh, I still use. I still use and we use every day when we train our athletes on the mat. So John has been a tremendous influence in me. Um, he is the, like I said, he's the founder of the Shingitai Jiu-Jitsu organization. But he was also the Olympic Training Center coach for seven, eight, nine years. I can't recall how many. And I would spend m many hours coming, driving out to Colorado Springs and with me, myself, or Becky, or some of my athletes, Kenny Brink, some of the other guys. We'd hop in the car. We'd stay at John's house, and we'd train at the Olympic Training Center with him. We'd get our day passes, of course, to be all official. But we would train with John. And he was a, a great coach. He was uh, instrumental in training a lot of our our top elite athletes at the U.S. Olympic Training Center back in, in the 1980s to the 1990s. So there are a lot of athletes have you know, owe John a lot. And a lot of coaches like me owe John a lot. Tremendous influence on me. And I think he's got a brilliant mind. And he still is active. He lives in Ohio. He's an Ohio boy. He always said Ohio is God's country. And he moved back there after he left Colorado Springs and doing his thing at the Olympic Training Center. And he still has his National Shingitai headquarters there, and he still trains people in, in jiu-jitsu as well. So John Saylor has been a tremendous and very positive influence in my life. While Neil Adams wasn't one of my primary coaches, he certainly had a tremendous influence in my judo uh, and, and my way of looking at sambo and jiu-jitsu as well. Uh, I can't really recall when I met Neil. I met him at some international tournament, I believe, at some time. We were both coaching at that time. He had retired from, from competing. And uh, what, what the, the foremost thing, one of the, the highlights of my career in, in, in training on the mat was uh, a bunch of us got together, I think, sometime in the early 19, 1993, I believe it was. And we went over and spent uh, just a, f a few short weeks training with Neil at his dojo in Coventry, England. And Neil Adams, I think, of course, is, is one of the foremost masters of judo. He's now a ninth don, uh, certainly deserving of that. And I think he'll be a tenth don someday. And he's, he's one of the the faces, the voices of, of international judo, as he should be. Uh, but he's, he's been influential in, in many people's lives in judo, not just me, but many other people. Uh, he's a master of jujigatami. And when I went over in the early 1990s to train with Neil, I was pretty good at jujigatami. But just a few short weeks I trained with him, I became much better at jujigatami and had a wider and broader appreciation and understanding of how to do that arm lock. 
And uh, so I credit him a lot with my development and work in, in uh, new ways of doing jujigatami. He's just brilliant at it. But again, Neil Adams is one of the, the greats, all-time greats of judo. I believe personally he's the, the best judo man I ever physically touched. And I, I can't say enough good things about him. So uh, Neil Adams was a tremendous influence in my judo career. I believe that in life, sometimes you learn because of people and sometimes you learn in spite of people. And the people I mentioned here today certainly were a positive influence on me. And I learned many things in life because of these good people who helped me along the way. So uh, thanks so much for Dave Roman to, uh, for asking this question. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the video.